What's good, brothers and sisters? Welcome back to the MatchNet podcast. This is a solo episode on the idea of finding community and the right community to move long term, to raise a family, to grow up in. And I'm making this video not knowing if I'm going to publish it on the podcast, but I'm hoping that at least for a few people it'll be very, very relevant to. It's something that a lot of people are considering when they are starting family, getting matched, getting blessed, thinking about raising children. I think that there's a few perspectives that I have have been very insightful and helpful for me to feel very confident in my decision to raise my family here in good old North Carolina, United States. That uh, I, I think, and especially in talking with people all the time, I mean, you yourself probably talk endlessly with individuals who are considering where to live and where's the action happening, where's a good community to raise a family, community, nature, uh, cost of living, all those things that are big considerations. Uh, and I want to share just a few perspectives that have been very helpful for me and maybe they're helpful for you as well. The first thing I'll say is that it is probably a healthy perspective and mindset and mentality to not make moving to a location such a weighted, heavy, long-term decision. In other words, I think it's reasonable that you should do your research, you should talk to people, you should go to the to the area and you know hang out with some people and get to know the area, but don't make it feel like it's a life or death situation where you're going to live there for eternity, all right? Where in reality, it's probably a healthier approach to feel, I'm gonna maybe move here and make the decision, have the courage and boldness to make the decision to go somewhere and live there for, I'd say at, at least two years to feel like you have a comfortable understanding of what it's like to live in that area. And this is a liberating way to feel because you don't have to feel like you're pigeonholing your life or boxing boxing in your life experience because at any point you could feel like, you know what, this is you know maybe not the decision to, to be in the right place, all right? So I would say that that is probably a healthier perspective to have. The second mentality that has been really helpful for me is realizing that the, the number one thing that is going to determine the success of your family and your blessed family and your relationships and your future and your lineage is not where you raise your children. It's not the community, even though it's important, yes. It's not the school district or the neighborhood that you raise your children around. It is actually the quality of you as a parent. It is the environment in which a child grows up that determines and predicates most strongly how children end up, okay? And this is interesting and it's very important because case in point, how many people do we, do we know, do you know, that grew up in the boondocks of middle of nowhere, random countries, random states in the US and with no community or church faith community perhaps, but grew up with a strong sense of family and environment where they had loving parents a loving mother and a father, which are by far the greatest privilege anyone on planet Earth can have. If you grow up in that environment, it is the people in the community or the neighborhood or the school district or all the things that we tend to look at as important don't nearly come as important as what kind of home environment do you have, period, end of, end of story, okay? And so am I saying that community is not important? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying all those things that we tend to worry about are not important. I'm saying that if you ignore the fundamental building blocks of what a healthy family is, is who are your parents? How are you raising your children? What is the blessing relationship between the husband and wife, actually? That should be the focus. Secondarily, you can focus on other things. But if you choose to ignore that fact, then you're going to be left in a situation where you're eternally trying to find the right place to live. And I know so many families that are stuck in this trap. And it consumes so much of people's mental real estate and bandwidth and headspace and heart space to the point where they're always, always looking for the next place to land their family. And it's not helpful because it's distracting you from what really needs the focus, which is make a community wherever you are, wherever you are on the planet. It is foolish and ludicrous to say that I can't make a community. I can't raise my family and my children in a community because there are no blessed families around me. Ludicrous. Go out there and make a community. Whatever that means to you. Figure out what it means and make it happen. So this is the second mentality that I've adopted that has helped me tremendously is in North Carolina, I'm going to make this the place that I want to live. 
The third thing that you can focus on to help make a confident decision, a decisive, clear, clear decision, is to list the priorities for what's really important, okay? So after talking with many, many, many people about community and helping them land somewhere to live, live in fact, we just had a couple move uh, or visit North Carolina, live in our house for a weekend to just scout out the area. How is North Carolina, all right? And so we're having a lot of discussions on what's important to you in finding a community and list those priorities in order of what's most important, all right? And so in having this conversation with this couple, we broke down three things for, for most people, but you can you know, list them out for yourself, which is important. There's number one, which is the people uh, in that community. In particular, if we're talking about a faith community, the people that are in the community, are you able to not just have people, but do you have people that you can develop deep relationships with? I would say that I would rather have a few people that are, I can create deep relationships with rather than a bunch of people that I see every so often, okay? And so number one is, are there people in that community that you can connect deep, deeply with? Number two that came up was nature and climate, okay? So uh, things like trees, things like an ocean, things like the mountains, those kinds of things are really important for some people as well. And the third thing that came up is uh, cost of living, all right? So considering all those things, which one is the most important for you, okay? And it's kind of challenging to find something that is really relevant to everyone all the time and has everything perfect. Another thing would be like family and relatives. Do you have relatives in that area as a high priority, okay? So list them out. What are the things that are most important to you? Prioritize them in order. Try to find something that hits most of the big priorities, the big rocks in your life. And sometimes there is something that's important, but you're willing to uh, not sacrifice it, but willing to create that from within yourself. For example, cost of living. Maybe there's an area that you want to move to, but the cost of living is very high. Well, is there a way that you can make more money or reduce the cost of living for your particular family so that you don't have to spend so much? Okay, there's ways to do that. Perhaps your thing is you want to uh, have a faith community to connect with, but there's not a lot of people that are of your faith in that community. Well, an option would be to find people, just a few people, and create very, very deliberate and deep relationships with those few people as a way to have a community. Or perhaps you can organize and create your own events or get-togethers once a month or every few months just for the people in the community so that you can foster and develop that sense of community instead of trying to go wherever the community is and wherever the action ha happens to be and landing there, but actually saying, you know what, I'm going to create that environment right here where I am yeah, and make that happen. So I know this is such a massive point of conversation and just consumes a lot of people's attention and then trying to figure out how to make things work long term. Ultimately, if you can stop thinking of it as such a dire one time decision, but actually more lighthearted a little bit and more of an enjoyable le learning experience and a decision that you can make uh, as a couple or as a family or as an individual is just you can, you can reasonably try out an area to live in and make a decision if that's the place to, to live for you, right? Uh, secondly, if you can try to recognize that the most important thing in long-term growth and satisfaction of your family and your lineage comes from how are you as an individual? How are you as a couple? How are you as a family? And that will create the community that you want because that is much more indicative of the success of a family and children long-term than the particulars of the external environment itself. And I'm not saying those aren't important. I'm saying that if you have a skewed priority system and a skewed understanding of what's truly important, then you're missing the mark completely. And you're missing the opportunity to focus on something that's really important, okay? So it's a matter of priority. And thirdly, if you can figure out what are the main priorities in terms of uh, hopes and desires for the particular place you want to live and then listing them out of most important and the least important and focusing on the most important ones and trying to find ways if you can create and manifest the things that are, are less important for you all right and if you can land in a community where you have everything that you want then that's wonderful for my me and my example uh, here in North Carolina uh, my parents live here right that's a plus 
I grew up here, so I know the area. I have mm, two or three very close friends that are here with me in North Carolina that I feel like I can connect deeply with and that satisfies my need for community and connection, right? Do we have a lot of members here that are devoutly faithful and religious? Not really, compared to some of the other communities. We're kind of a medium-sized community. We have tons of tons of young adult professionals living here from all over the world and America uh, because they move here because North Carolina is amazing. We've got great weather, we've got great people, we've got great jobs, we've got great schools, universities, and it's just a pleasant place to be. The people are very pleasant. So a lot of people are moving here. And, uh, and so what we're trying to do is actually create that community that we have and gather them every so often so that we can do things uh, together and, and have a sense of bonding and go deep with each other. And uh, it's great. It's a wonderful place. It's nature all around us. We have trees all over our house. If you go in our backyard, it's just trees and nature as far as the eye can see. We have a beautiful greenway, a biking path that goes behind our house. And uh, it's just a, a very peaceful place to live. We live about 20 minutes from an international airport. It's a smooth drive. There's no traffic going going there. And it's been nice to live by the airport because of the traveling that's that's being done by, by me and, and, and my family. We travel quite a bit. So it's, uh, it's quite a nice place to live. So I'm making this a plug for North Carolina, sure, but I'm also explaining my thought process of things. We, before North Carolina, moved from New Jersey, right, which we had kind of the opposite end of the spectrum in many regards, in, the, in such that we had a very large community to the point where it was overwhelming, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly large, <laughs> a lot of people, lots of communities. It's almost like we had to choose every Sunday which church to go to, which is a nice problem to have, but also a little bit like, okay, what are we doing here? You know, are we part of this community or part of this church? So we would go to, you know, two or three different churches in one month just because we know different people and we want to kind of visit different individuals and families. And then, of course, I didn't like driving. I didn't like the nature uh, or less nature in New Jersey than, than North Carolina. Cost of living was a lot higher. So it's a place to live. Uh, but for us, I would rather have a few community members that I'm really close with than a whole bunch of people. And uh, that's kind of the logic that, that we're going with. And ultimately, guys, I don't spend any time or headspace thinking about where to live, which is why this is a, a nice liberating decision to make because I just made the decision and I was just like, this is going to make, this is going to work because I'm going to make it work no matter what. And I'm lived, I'm living with that decision. And I treat the same decisions as I do with many of the big aspects of my life, especially my marriage, and my children. This is the wife that I have and I'm going to make it work no matter what. Right. And so none of my bandwidth is taken up by you know, is there someone else? Look it around, check it out, other women. It's like, no, this is decision and that's it. So that's very liberating for me. And when you guys who are single and not matched yet, when you find your spouse and you commit to it 100%, you will free up so much of your mental real estate so that you can focus on other things. So that you can focus on creating the marriage and the family that you want, all right? And so at the same time, I have decided this is the place I wanna live and I'm gonna make it work. And I'm going to put all that excess energy instead of thinking about, oh, maybe there's somewhere better to live. I'm going to make this work because this is where I am. And the result is I love where I live. I do. I love the people. I love the community. I love the nature a lot. I love the slow pace of, of North Carolina. I love the environment. I love the weather. I love everything about it, right? So, and that's only because I've chosen to love it. Are there things I could pick a bar and say, this is not ideal? Sure, of course, all the time. But I choose to live here and I dedicate myself to living here because it's where it is until it makes sense to live otherwise. And I'm not saying that you have to box yourself into one location for eternity. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying choose a, des a destination to live and to raise your family, make it work until it makes sense to move somewhere else. And you will know when it makes sense to move somewhere else. But don't fall for the trap of the grass is greener on the other side. There's a community or an experience out there that is much better for my children or for me and my marriage. It's not. Where you are is where the fruits of your life will come to fruition. 
for years and decades to come. It's where you are right now. How's the saying go? Home is where your family is. Home is where the heart is. It's not somewhere else. Some people don't have the luxury, perhaps, of thinking of, oh, which place should I go to? Which community should I join? Which church should I attend to? If you have the luxury, which I assume you do because you're watching this video, it's a luxury to have. And it's kind of a challenging position to be in where we have so many options in life that is overwhelming. Just think about marriage for a second. For a second. How many people are talking about they, they know the right way to be a married couple? All the things you should and shouldn't do, how you should raise your children and shouldn't raise your children. I remember when I first had our first kid, it's like World War III, people talking about, oh, you should always drink almond milk. You should never drink almond milk. You should only drink whole milk. You should never, ever drink whole milk. You should co-sleep with your children. You should never co-sleep with your children. It is endless. And no one has any idea what they're talking about. Is all that stuff important? Yeah, sure. But is it nearly as important as how much love is in your family? Nothing. How many parenting gurus or advisors or teachers have sat with me, none, or you, or none, and said, you know what? All this is important, sure. But as long as you deeply, unconditionally love your children, right, with God's love, then does it really matter so much? In the context of you receiving love yourself, feeling so much grace and love and acceptance and God's unconditional essence in your life, and you pass that on to your children, does it really matter if they drink almond milk or whole milk or soy milk? or oat milk? <laughs> no. Not nearly as much. Sure it matters, sure, of course. Do what you want. But does it matter nearly? And we're missing the point if we're distracted by the things that don't matter nearly as much as are we experiencing God and we're we passing that love on to people around us, especially our family and our children, our parents, the people around us, our neighbors. We're missing the point completely. If we are endlessly looking around and where's the community? Where's the action happening? And we're forgetting to make a community where we already are. We're missing the point. Okay? So, I'm saying this. Why? Because it is wrong to want to live in a, no, a nice community with love and affection. No, that's not wrong. I'm make, making this. Because if you're in a situation where you find a lot of your prioritization in your bandwidth, in your, in your mind, in your mental real estate, is taken up by grass is greener on the other side concepts yeah then i think that there is something fundamentally flawed in that from the perspective of what is really important in life and do you have the foundations and the fundamentals in life and on that foundation sure go ahead think away but if you're if you could be utilizing that headspace for things that are more important to you that you really care about like preparing for matching making yourself an excellent stellar matching candidate and a spouse, being a great husband or wife, having children. Mm. If you're distracted by career and university and I can't have kids because I'm so busy, is it really that important? Yeah, of course it's important. But is it nearly as important as what really matters in life? And I'm not saying this guy is a form of judgment. I've been distracted for many years. I've been so distracted. Actually, right now I'm distracted making this video for you guys because my, my kids were trying to go to bed and they're downstairs trying to get to bed. And I need to go down there and, and say goodnight to them and do our evening closing together where I listen to them and I ask questions and they ask me questions. And we talk about our day, talk about challenges, victories for the day, right? As we do every night. Sometimes we spend 30 minutes, an hour just talking right before bed in our bed, just in their bed, in their bedroom. And uh, I've been distracted from a lot of that. For many years, been distracted by stuff that doesn't matter nearly as much, right? Of course, all the things I do, I think, are really important. Making content for you guys in this video, in this episode, of course, I think it's important. I believe it's important. But I will never, ever again let that become my number one priority right now in my life. At this stage in my life, my children are young, and they need my number one priority to be raising them to be wise individuals. They need that. And I want that. And I don't want to be distracted. And so I will not ever let my mind wander to things that are not nearly as important as that. Yeah. 
And so a good litmus test to see where your priorities are in life <clears throat> is what do you think about when you go to bed at night? What do you think about as soon as you wake up in the morning? Right? Mother has said, I mentioned in a previous episode that Yana Nim came to speak with us in Korea. And she said that true mother's standard of what public mission is, is you think about God before you do everything. You put God before everything. No matter what you do, if you do it with God first, it is a public offering, which is beautiful. You could be a stay-at-home parent, think about God first, a public mission. Ooh, it's beautiful. You could be an Uber driver that wakes up early in the morning to drive your Uber people. <laughs> think about God first. Public mission. Oh, that's beautiful. You could be a leader of CARP, leader of the world, president of family federation, whatever it is in your future. I hope those are in the cards for you. Do that with God first. Public mission. But even if you do those things that look like a public mission, but you do it for yourself, interesting. We get into murky waters there. Is that a public mission? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so, actually. If you're leading your family as a parent and you do it with God first, public life, it's for God. Ooh, it's beautiful. But if you do that with yourself first, is it for God? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes it's a mixed bag, right? I think for me, a lot of time I was not thinking of God first and it's something I have had to reconcile with and work on this episode for example uh, I think later when I post it or I, when I consider posting it I'm going to think to myself you know what I probably shouldn't post this it's too it's too selfish it's too me it's too vain it's too just me trying to share my own thoughts right but I know that the impetus for my heart to share this is actually based on years and years of conversations with individuals who have been struggling with these exact points of not knowing what to do with life, not knowing what to focus on, not knowing what to prioritize. And th so the impetus of my heart to make this episode is really, I have been through that. I've been exactly through those things. And I have perspectives and a mentality that has been really serving me well and I feel really at peace and confident and comfortable with my decisions. And if it can help somebody, uh, then I want to do that. And that comes from a really pure and good part of my heart. But then the other side of me, you know, whatever you want to call it, the shadows, the, the sinful, the fallen nature of me, you know, will try to focus on myself and how I'm appearing and how I'm looking, right? The quality of my video is not really great right now and I wish I did it a better quality. Maybe the audio is not coming through great, yeah? Maybe I should have worn a different shirt that was a little more colorful because this is really bland, <laughs> all the things. Maybe I should have shaved a little, whatever. I don't care. I mean, I care a little bit, that's why I'm mentioning it, but I'm choosing to focus on the good in me, the light in me, which is I'm doing this because it comes from a good place and you, my, fr my, my brother, my friend, my sister, you have a goodness in you. you. You do. A lot of the things, the big decisions that you've made in your life come from a good place. Your desire to go on that gap year program or to fundraise or to witness. Your desire to connect with your parents. Your desire to get matched and blessed. My goodness. The impetus of those decisions are truly, truly of God, of goodness, right? I was talking with a mentor recently and I was saying, telling him about all these ideas I'm having for business and marketing because I love advertising. I love running paid advertising for things. Anyways, it's a different story, but I love advertising. And I was telling this mentor of mine, I was saying, I have all these ideas and I want to just run a hundred miles an hour with my ideas and I have to kind of squash them down because they're too much and I have to stay focused on the main things I'm doing. And I was telling him how I was feeling like guilty for having so many ideas. I felt like a child, like I just wanted more and more. Uh, I wanted to grow a business bigger and bigger and bigger and all that kind of stuff. And he looked at me and he was like, don't, don't uh, devalue the ideas you have because God is like that. 
He said that to me. God gets excited about ideas, just like you are. And I realized that I didn't even know it, but I was turning my goodness, my godly ideas, into and believing them to be sinful and selfish and satanic. And I was saying subconsciously in my mind, your ideas are wrong and bad and selfish, and you should squash them because they are not correct. And this mentor, he reminded me kindly, John Lowen, if you're listening, thank you, John Lowen. He reminded me, he's like, God is like that. That is God's essence, to get excited about ideas. Don't you think God gets excited by creating new things? And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But the, the, the twist in the story is I, I didn't even see that. It was a shadow I was holding onto for a long time and I didn't even see because I was covering that light inside me with a little bit of darkness. And that little bit of darkness was saying, you're wrong, you're evil, you're sinful, right? So it's an example of many instances, instances in my life and in your life and I know that you have twisted or the enemy, the devil, your fallen nature, whatever you call it, guys, has twisted your goodness in favor for itself and said, hey, this thing that you do or have done, it is evil and you are wrong and selfish because of it. You are selfish because of it. A long time, my uh, f underlying assumption about my sexuality for example, has been that my sexuality is bad. It is wrong. It is evil. It is self-centered. And I thought this for decades of my life, that my sexuality is wrong because of past experiences, mistakes, whatever. And it wasn't even into many years into my blessing that uh, I stopped to ask the question because somebody asked it to me, where is the goodness in your sexuality? Oh my gosh, this is an insightful question that nobody stops to ask. What is the goodness in your sexuality? And I thought about it and I was like, well, I have three children. Mm. I have given life to kids. I have given life to a family. I have given birth to a lineage. I have given life to my, my wife. I have created, uh, I've made my wife a mother. I've given her purpose and fulfillment and joy that you can only experience. I've become a father. That comes from a really good place. And when I saw that, I was like, you know what? Dang it, my sexuality is really, really good because it comes from God. And that makes sense, that's obvious. Obviously your sexuality comes from God. Who created you? Who made you a sexual being? Who gave you that high sex drive, my friends? God did, interesting. But why is it that we don't stop and recognize that ever ever. Ooh, there's something that's covering that deep feeling that is in all of us. And my sexuality is a good thing. There's something that's covering it. Something that's really dark, really insidious, really constant, really, really subtle. It's almost like the darkest things are right beneath our nose. It's almost like the darkest shadows are right beneath our feet. And when I noticed that, I was like, oh my God, I've been assuming falsely that my sexuality is selfish and I should squash it. And I realized, actually, it's really good. That was a turning point for me and my sexuality because I realized it's a good thing. And so I stopped feeling shame and weight, weightedness and heaviness around my sexuality because I knew it was a good thing. True father, true parents know that sexuality is good. Why would true father talk so much about sexuality so openly to people that he probably shouldn't talk about it with? Politicians, leaders, religious leaders, openly, at forums, at international forums, <laughs> at giant events. He would talk openly about the sexual organs, about sexuality, about God's absolute sex vision, right? Even to the point where people weren't translating it. People were so uncomfortable translating it and they wouldn't do it. We have volumes and volumes and volumes of texts in Korean, those green books, hundreds of them, that have not been translated into English, ever. Interesting. There's also the things that no one ever translated, that no one ever wrote, because it's too embarrassing, too too shameful to talk about. Guys, this is true father we're talking about. It wasn't something to hide. It wasn't something to be shameful about. So why is it that we are? 
So why is it that when I talk about sexuality, there's something in you that goes, I don't know if we need to talk about this. I don't know if this is relevant to this podcast. I don't know. Guys, if we're not talking about sexuality and the blessing, then what are we doing? What are we doing, my friends? Is the blessing not everything to do with sexuality? Is the blessing not everything to do with reversing what was made incorrectly in the, at the fall, at the beginning of human history? Is the fall not about sexuality? Is the blessing not reversing that fallen sexuality? Is the blessing not about using our sexual organs for godly purposes, right? Whether you're single or in a relationship. If we're not talking about sexuality and the blessing, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing. Okay? So when is Benji going to stop talking about sexuality and the sexual organs? Probably never. <laughs> because it has everything to do with it. And I talk about it because I've experienced so much darkness, shame, and liberation in my understanding of absolute sex and sexuality. And I know that it is one of the greatest shadows and points of shame in individuals' lives that keeps them from receiving the blessing, that keeps them from feeling confident to receive the blessing. I know. I grew up in this world too, guys. I know. Don't forget that. I grew up with the internet. I know. So that's why we talk about it. Because the blessing has absolutely everything to do with heavenly, God-centered sexuality. And so now, after going through that process of shame, shadows, liberation, freedom, light, experiencing God, and now I pass this on to my children. We have a very open dialogue and communication about everything. Anything that I feel like is a sense of heaviness or weight or fear around, I'll bring it up. I'll notice it like an antenna that goes off and I'll say, I'm going to talk about this right now. When we're driving with my, with my son, picking him, bring, picking up from school, I'll talk about this stuff, man. My daughters, two girls, talk about this. With my wife, he to it. My goodness, she, she, we talk about this stuff, you know. Because I don't want my children to feel like something is too heavy to talk about. I don't want them to feel like something is too dark that we can't talk about it. Yeah. And so the result is my son especially, he's nine years old, he will just bring stuff up midday while we're watching TV. Like there's some like romantic scene between the characters in Pokemon or whatever, some ca cartoon we're watching. And he'll like bring it up. He'll talk about something related to the fall or something related to whatever. It's just a nice casual kind of conversation. And I believe that that is the attitude that, that true parents have around this. And it's been bestowed to me, right, through the blessing. And I'm hoping that this is what will be passed on to lineages in decades to come. Okay, we started this episode with how to make decisive, clear decisions and how to have perspectives and mental frameworks that are helpful for making these decisions. And we got into fears and shadows. Shadows are the feeling of feeling stuck and I can't move forward because of my fear which is the opposite of courage all right we don't want to be cowards we want to have courage okay so all I'm asking you to do is to make a vision for yourself for your matching for your blessing for your family move forward courageously don't be afraid to make that decision to quit that job to quit that university degree that you hate and you don't even know why you're doing. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to put yourself on a matching website. Don't be afraid to have a conversation with someone to see if it's a possible matching. Don't be afraid to reach out for support if you need help. Just do it. Just do it. And chances are you will take one direction in one direction and then you will course correct as you go. But where people get stuck is they are have analysis paralysis where they feel like I have to make the right decision otherwise I'll be eternally going in the wrong direction and a fear of that is what's keeping people stuck and hinders them from moving forward but the reality of life careers moving to locations relationships is that you just make a decision and you course correct you marry your wife your husband you choose that person and you course correct that relationship Things come up in your relationship, you deal with it. You grow together and you move together in the direction that you want to go. 
but you have to be going in the right direction. You have to be going in the direct direction together. We talk endlessly right here on the podcast about what to look for in terms of your vision and mission. Someone asked today, insightful question, what's the most common reason that people end the matching process, right? And we don't have data on that. We have anecdotal experience. And so what I told this individual that was asking the question is if people don't have an aligned vision for the, themselves, a mission for their lives, that is where eventually things get rocky and you kind of split paths. If your entire relationship is based on infatuation or looks or external things, and is not based fundamentally in a common vision, the common vision itself is what is going to make the relationship stronger over time because you will continually together course correct towards that relationship, regardless of how rocky it gets, regardless of the disagreements, regardless of what happens internally, externally in your relationship. If you're moving towards the same vision, then together you will course, you will course correct because together each individual will grow in that direction. All right. So then the question becomes, what is that vision? And this is what get, where people get tripped up. I've noticed the vision and mission don't have to be as detailed as you think it might be. It's like, oh, I want to do, for example, youth ministry. I want to be a youth pastor. Or I want to be a leader for some company. Or I want to, uh, whatever it is, doesn't matter. I want to start a nonprofit. I want to, those are all means to an end. Those are all stepping stones for a final destination. What is that final destination we're talking about? In the context of the blessing, I'll give it to you really straight, really simple. You want to create a blessed family. That's it. That's simple. A happy, a joyful, a radiant, a serving, a loving, blessed family. A blessed family. That's it. And how you get there will look very different. One of you will do that in one way. One of you will do that in a different way. For my wife and I, I'm out here slaying dragons every day, talking with people, mentoring people, making content, education, hustling working long hours, sometimes late into the night. And my wife, God bless her, she finds a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment taking care of the children at home. Together we do that. But she spends the majority of her attention and bandwidth on the children. And that's how we get to our final destination, right? We're doing the same mission, but the way we do it is very different. The way our day-to-day -day looks is very different. And that's the case for every couple under the sun. The things you guys do in your day-to-day -day will be very different. So don't get too caught up on your life in the uh, means to the end sense, the stepping stones, the day-to-day -day don't have to look exactly the same. Have a conversation. What do you want? I want to create a blessed family. Bingo. So what is implied in that? Number one, you want to have children. Number two, you want to have a good marriage and relationship to raise those children. Number three, you want to raise those children well to be wise individuals, to be godly individuals, and to pass on the tradition of the blessing because we're talking about the context of the blessing here, guys. And if you want that, if you both want that, go for it. I'm serious. Go for it. That is really all that is required. That's it. And on top of that, I would say the quality part, it's like, okay, if you just have a common vision, is that enough to make a successful relationship? No, because one of you might be a degenerate loser that sleeps around and, or sleeps in, sorry, not sleep, <laughs> sleeps in all day and plays video games all night and whatever. If these two individuals are, the second part is, are you both willing to learn how to love unconditionally each other? That's it. If you have the willingness to learn, not are you able to love unconditionally? Are you willing to learn that no matter what happens in the relationship, I will accept my responsibility in this relationship and I will learn how to love. Doesn't mean accept. God's unconditional love and grace does not mean acceptance and tolerance. It means that even though you might have made a mistake, even though you might be wrong, I will choose to love you. I will learn how to love you. I will be willing to learn how to love you. If you have those two people together, you can make it work. 
you will make it work. You absolutely will crush it, my friends. <laughs> you will make it an absolutely radiant blessing and blessed family. Even though I had nothing going for me when I first got blessed at it as a young man, externally, internally, I was willing to do whatever it took. My wife, the same. Willing to give grace. She is giving me more grace than I could have ever asked for from a wife. More than I'm even worthy of. But I know that that grace comes from God, and from God, I am worthy of that grace and that love. And that is why we are in a position now where we are so joyfully expressing God's love to, to our children and people around us. And it is a joy to be in his family. My wife, I asked her just yesterday, we went on a date night, and I asked her, are you happy? And she says, she's the happiest woman she knows. <laughs> She said she is the happiest woman she knows. Not in like a, you know, comparative, judgmental way to other women. But she knows so many women, especially mothers of young children, who are just stressed and just busy, eternally busy and stressed about all the things in life. And she said, my life is pretty, pretty nice, pretty smooth. Yeah. And of course, I had to make a comment and I said, well, that's because you have a good husband that protects you. <laughs> that cares for you, right? And I do. I prioritize my wife's well-being and her peace of mind so much so that I will sacrifice a lot of my own uh, joy and my own hobbies and my own time and my own health sometimes so that she can be happy. And that's a joy for me because that affects me so much. If my wife is happy, I am so deeply grateful and so happy that I will do anything for my wife to have a good day. You know, the old saying like happy wife, happy life, if you've heard that, it is 100% true, but it's a little bit dicey because it's not a healthy way to live in the sense that your entire happiness is dependent on someone else's happiness. Because the other side of that is if they're miserable and having a miserable time, it also makes you miserable. Interesting. If she's sad and depressed, I also many times have felt sad and depressed or I'm failing and so the key is to when she's happy I will prioritize making her happy and I'm joyful I have the best days ever my children are so happy when she's happy and having a great day and when she's not having a great day which something sometimes happens I have learned to not take it personally make it about me but actually just realize okay now is a time where she really needs some support right she really needs my help she needs me to take the kids out to go swimming for an afternoon so that she can recharge herself. She needs to go and have a conversation with her sister or her mother or someone in our community. She needs that time to recharge. Yeah? Okay. Lots of love to you guys. I have to get going. If you like this kind of long-form uh, impromptu content please let me know like message me or comment or something let me know somehow so that i can make more of it for you guys because i just want to be helpful and love you guys uh all right you are loved more than you know you are loved more than you know join the matchnet program at matchnet.us if you haven't yet just plug in for that um subscribe follow to this podcast because you'll spend more time with us and uh we'll love you guys more all right lots of love